Good morning. Um, I'm talking about backporting BPF, the technique and challenges. This talk, and it's less about BPF, and more about backporting in general. So I'm Shang Si Yu, and I work on BPF related things, mostly in the internal rather than the application. And I'm part of the hardware enablement lab Taipei under Joy Li, and we're part of the Labs Core. So I live in Taidong, Taiwan, which is quite a beautiful place, and I'm a very lively drinker. But before we get to the drinking part, um, backporting. So I want to give this talk because I want to kind of create a guide for my younger self in terms of how to do BPF backporting. But I think this will also help other newcomers and maybe someone watching from YouTube in the future. And I know this, this room is for an audience that have more backporting experience, perhaps more time than my whole technical career. So for, for this audience, I hope this can still spark some discussion and I could get some feedback uh, on how it can be done better. So I will leave around 15 minutes at the end for hopefully some discussion. So backgrounds. For completeness, I'll start with the very beginning. So what is backporting? To discuss backporting, we have to talk about the vocabulary. So upstream. Upstream is the vocabulary we use to talk about the main place where the software development happen. For the kernel side, the upstream is, of course, the tree maintained by Linux. And in contrast, downstream is what we refers to our kind of um, our SUSE specific fork that we maintain and we provide to a customer. And this is usually branched off of somewhere of a tag release within this tree. And backporting is, simply put, taking a commit from the upstream and applying that patch to our downstream fork. That's it. That's just taking a patch, cherry picking to our downstream. And, but not, commit, not all of the commit are equal. If you roughly look at the commit, you can categorize into kind of like two categories. So one kind of commit is like the feature commit. The other is the fixed commit. For the feature commit, it could be more than just a feature, maybe refactoring or optimization, but mainly it does quite a lot of change. On the other end of the spectrum is like the fix. Well, it fixes something. And the reason I want to talk about this difference is because we also have kind of like two different modes within our downstream. So our downstream could be something used in the release plot, uh, product, like 15 SP4. And in that case, we're mainly uh, focusing on stability. Uh, on the other hand, we have something that's used in unreleased product. And in that case, it's kind of like a work in progress. So it's still being developed. And I'll use the term development branch and maintenance branch here. I don't think it's the best vocabulary, but we'll use that for now. And for the fixed commit, the answer is simple. We almost always want to have the fix applied. So we take it both in the maintenance branch and the development branch. However, for the feature commit, it's kind of different. We usually just apply it to the development branch and the reason is for stability and also KABI, which we'll be talking about later. And with that background provided, we're now ready to talk about the challenges associated with backporting. So the first major challenge is patch dependency. Dependency management is sort of like a thing that you never get away from in software engineering. And in backporting, it's, it's the same. So dependency is still an issue. If you roughly look at the, the patch and all the patch that comes before it, you can roughly categorize them into three things. So either it's a patch that your patch really need to function correctly, or it's unrelated or related. But we'll get to get later. So for those patch that 
your current patch really need, I would say, as dependent. And the, the hardest thing about backporting is that a commit don't have a very explicit dependency. You cannot just look at the commit message and understand what commit comes along with it. And furthermore, to complicate the issue, a patch would also need other patches, so it kind of like it kind of grow exponentially. And for the development branch, uh, the the I just use a simple strategy. So I, I I go very greedy and I take up every single BPF commit. But that's not as simple as it sounds. So what is everything for BPF? Well, it's of course every change to BPF related file. But the trouble with BPF is that unlike uh, drivers, drivers have some, drivers usually have the changes, uh, the files all in a specific directory. So BPF doesn't really have that. And BPF have some directory that have BPF files, of course. But on the other hand, there's also like this header files and things they are in the architecture, and also for several files include, and it's, it's kind of everywhere. So the way around this is just like taking an iterative approach. I start with some files that I know are BPF related. Then I look at those commit, and I also find commit in the same patch set. So I look for other, so I look, look for the commit in the same patch set, I find what file they modified, and I gather all these commits and kind of sort through the file name by frequency. And then I review them, and usually it's enough just by looking at the name, but sometimes it's not. And I just come up with this list. So of course, in the future, it still needs to be updated. But at least that's kind of sorted. And the next thing about BPF is that BPF actually works with a lot of different subsystems. And that means that it may depend on patch from other subsystems. And the way I try to deal with this is to always take patch from the same patch set as the commit I'm backporting. And that usually takes care of, takes care of most of the issue, uh, not always. And so usually the application might, uh, applying a patch might fail, but usually it will come with some kind of like identifier, maybe it's missing a variable or a function, and I'll use that as a keyword to search within the upstream uh, under the keyword, and then try to look for the commit that's associated that I need and take it. So, Again, for development branch, the strategy is to be greedy. On the other hand, the maintenance branch doesn't have that luxury. So you have to try to create the, to try to find the most minimum patch set for it. Luckily for most, for, well, I guess for the majority of time, the fix is usually not that big. So if I'm lucky, usually the patch is just a single patch and fixes. If it's not, then I don't really have a good strategy. It's just trials and error, uh, pick the patch, try to apply, test it, uh, test it with the customer, and see if it works, and go over. So there's not really a good strategy here. And the, the third kind of issue with the patch dependency is the order of the, uh, the applying patch matters. We rarely talk about this nowadays for a good reason. But uh, to talk about it first, what, what ordering means in, in our downstream. So in our downstream, we have a file called the series conf, and the series conf will specify the order on, at which the patch are applied. So in this file, A will be applied first, then B, then C, and assuming that the patch all depends on their previous one. This will work. But say if you somehow have the order wrong, then this won't really work, and applying the patch will fail at probably at C. 
And the reason that we rarely talk about this right now is because we have a very good tool called Git Sort that ensures the order is the same as upstream. I say the same, but it's, it's not really the same because serious conf is kind of like a serialized file. Each patch has one that comes before and comes after. But the kernel commit tree is not that. It's, more, it's, a, it's, it's a name imply a tree, so more graph, more like graph, I guess. So anyway, so when when it, when git sort try to serialize the, the 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 patch file, you get only one dimension, and I think this is the reason that it, it occasionally runs into issue for me because the amount of BPF backporting patch, and and that will require some manual interaction. So back to the like the relationship with the other patch. So we talk about the dependent patch so far. On the other hand of the spectrum is the unrelated patch. Uh, for me, I, I don't need to care, and they're fine uh, whether I have it or not. It's, it's, well, I shouldn't back for them, actually. And I don't really care too much about them. But on the middle, this is like kind of like the murky part. So. Strictly speaking, my patch might not need it, but without it, it will affect me during backporting. And that is where the second challenge comes in, is that you need to do some patch adaptation. Essentially, the patch you take taken out straight from upstream may not apply to your, uh, local, your downstream branch. And to deal with that, you kind of have to like massage and change the patch a bit so it fits into your downstream. And this is usually only needed, mostly only needed for the maintenance branch because, uh, because for the development branch, we usually can just take everything and this isn't too much of an issue. For the maintenance branch, the older the branch you're dealing with, the harder it will get. And for the most usual part, a lot of time it's pretty simple. Like it could be just a context different. Say you have a patch that adds this init sum call to your to your main function, and in your downstream you have something different. Your main function have another local variable that got removed later. So if you try to apply this to patch directly, at first it will fail because the patch execute executable cannot find the exact location for the change. And this is actually quite simple. The way around this is to add the, to update kind of the context of your patch file. So you add this local variable inside your patch file. And by this, this is what we usually mean by a patch refresh. We changes the patch to, a, to addresses some difference. And with this, your patch will apply. All is good, I, su I suppose. And the, I think the, 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 this kind of challenge is actually quite trivial. So adapting the context, you don't really need to know that much into the inner working or how the code work. A lot of time, it's just simply changing a few lines. And to deal with that, we, it's actually, uh, I think, a quite common practice is to apply the patch with some fuzz. So but fuzz is that a kind of heuristic that allows the patch to be applied with some context line ignored. And I mostly work, so the, the our downstream SUSE kernel, we usually use Quilt to manage the patch. And I think the default a uh, fuzz number that code is, is two, which is sort of like a good balance because if you fuzz too much, then the code might be applied at the wrong place. But too little, then you have to deal with all those trivial issues a lot of times. Uh, sometimes that's not enough though, so you have to go to the reject file that patch create for you, then manually add update edit file. So now heading to, oh, sorry. And then 
also quite common is that the code may be moved to a different file. So it's not exactly context difference, but it's similar. So moving on to a more difficult uh, challenge. Sometimes that uh, your downstream patch those in maintenance will have some missing feature. For example, here's the upstream patch I have. The upstream patch as just as the go to out to two different case statements. But say in my downstream patch, I might have not back for this feature called timer. So my downstream will look like this. And of course, if I try to apply it directly, it won't work. Here we use the same. Uh, do the same thing, we need to manually intervene, remove this chunk, and then it'll work. So here in this situation, actually the fuzzing usually don't help that much. You almost always have to manually intervene and edit the files. And actually we really want applying patch to fail here because if it's success, you, it won't really work. So a more graphical view of this missing feature issue. So you have a feature, you have a fix that comes after it, and the fix kind of changes the feature, but also something before it, and you backport it into an adapted fix in your maintenance branch. But you could also start a new development branch from your maintenance branch. And within your development branch, you usually want to backport the latest thing, so you backport the feature there. This kind of created an awkward situation where you have something that's kind of out of order. And as you'll see, this creates some issue. The issue is that you need to undo the adaptation. So again, say, I now have backward this timer feature. But since the patch I heard from the maintenance branch look like this, when I apply it, it actually isn't really what the upstream result expects. And this is kind of like a backporting error that we have to deal with. This, again, I, I don't have a really good strategy to deal with this. Uh, the best I could hope is I remember all the things I've done, but it's not possible. So usually I need to have some note. And I have two different forms of note. The first I stole in from Tony, which I should be here. Yeah. Tony, hi. Anyway, so X info, within the X info email header, I add each change as an individual line within it. And it try to keep it short and concise, and also mention the commit that's associated. The other place I'll add a note is before the file stats. So for example, here's one of the patch file with the X info. So I mentioned why why the, uh, I mentioned the difference, so this function is in a different file, and I also mentioned what commit is needed. So when, hopefully when I back for that commit, I will grab, look for it within the X info, and if I found it, uh, undo the adaptation. And for more, I guess, more descriptive information, I usually put it before the, uh, stats, so I'll put my username and some assets I want to add. Now, for the, I think the most difficult part of patch adaptation, uh, it's KABI breakage. So for our release product, we have a promise to a customer that the kernel application binary interface is maintained. And the KABI consists of a lot of things, but more of the major one are the signature to the function call and the memory layout of the structs. So if I have a patch here that a fix that adds a new field to the struct object, it actually offsets all the memory layout. And if, and if I have some code that uses this struct, it actually causes an issue. So how to deal with the KABI is, I think, a whole talk of itself. Uh, here, I'll just talk about a very simple strategy. So if you have some struct that adds a, adds a new field, and if it is not embedded in other structs, a simple way is just move it to the end. But this is not always the case. So sometimes we need 
some preventive measure. And preventive measure in this case is to add padding. So usually when a product, uh, usually when a branch is still in development, you can change the KABI. And you want to do that in that case because prevention is easier than the treatment. And what you do is you identify the structs that have, uh, that is commonly embedded in other structs and you add some padding. Our conventional name is just the, uh, the SUSE KABI padding. So in the future, if you need to change the struct, you could take just the space that's available to you. And unlike the previous method where we change the patch itself, to deal with the KABI breakage, we actually do something different. So we would store the KABI changes within the patches KABI folder. And those are applied at the, the, the very end of the phase. And the good thing about this is that if you think about it, if you modify some patch for KABI, then the patch that come after it that you want to backport will also get affected and it's just like goes all the way down. So I think putting the KBI patch at the last separately is quite really a good strategy that keeps backporting uh, still hopefully easier. And there are still some other challenges associated with the backporting itself, but there, uh, I couldn't it's not such a big point. I think the first other challenge is that uh, branch merge. So our branch gets merged into other ones. And from there, some patch will be inherited. And the inherit patch sometimes may not be applied. So that's something that we need to be checked and usually bothers the branch maintainer. And another challenge is uh, fixes. So we have git fixes email that regularly reminds us of the fix that's available to the subsystem. And usually you, you want to take the fix, but there is some reason not to. For example, if the fix is too new, then you, you might not be sure if it's stable enough. And the other issue is that it also causes the missing feature that we talked about earlier, where, where you have to undo the adaptation. And that roughly summarized the, all the challenge for uh, backporting and BPF, well, BPF backporting in general. And to sum it all up, this is my workflow for BPF uh, backporting. So I should start by finding what the base release this branch is on. So for example, 5.13. Then I will try to get all the BPF related commit based on this base to the next one because BPF have quite a lot of commit. So moving too far ahead usually uh, there, there will be too much commit. So I usually just move between single release. So from all those BPF commit, I find all the commit that's in the same patch set and remove all the commit that I have already and review them. And I usually review them by subjects of the patch set. And if it's quite a large patch set, maybe look at the cover letters. But with the amount, I usually don't get too close of a look into the, the patch themselves. And then I can begin with the backporting. So heavy pass, which almost never happened, but, but hopefully does sometimes. So I use a uh, sequence insert to find the point that I should begin working in the series comp and then apply until that, that patch with sequence patch. And with quill mode, it provides uh, qadd and qdoit, which qadds adds the, a list of commit that you want to backport into a working queue. And qdoit will actually do the backporting automatically for you. And it also includes compile test to make sure to have kind of like a basic check that your backport works. And after that, uh, if the whole thing success, again, happy path. So I will again check that the whole series apply because, it, it, because some other patch might need to be refreshed. So it's good to check it. 
than test compile. And one thing I haven't been able to consistently do is that BPF have quite some comprehensive self self test, and I also do backport it. So I, I hope that in the future I can consistently run the self test to make sure it's the BPF subsystem is good. So if that all works, then I use git at all and the log to log to utility to commit and then push to the user tree and check, make sure that kbuild passes because kbuild also checks other architecture which I do not and then wait for the branch maintainer to merge. So unhappy pass. Usually when you, when you run qdoit, um, some patch will fail to apply. And the first case is that the patch you are actively backporting that you have chosen failed to apply. And that is, means that you probably have some missing dependency. So find it and add it to the work queue, then restart backporting again. The more, uh, the more annoying cases is actually when after you have some backport applied, then the, the patches that comes after it needs to be refreshed. So what I've learned in this case is that the best action to do is to commit all the current patches first, and then do a rebase that checks individual commit, so you want to have each commit um, be able to apply. Because otherwise, if you just refresh when you hit this error, what could happen is that you could be adapting the, you could be refreshing the patch uh, multiple step of the way. So when you apply it, single time, it could still need refresh. And then that's pretty much summarized all of my workflow for the BPF backporting. And some regrets for SV5 specific is that I, I started too late, which is kind of a rush. And this actually lead to the second issue. So when I backport, I do not take all the fix associated with the commit I'm backporting. And the reason is that I want to kind of avoid this missing feature gotcha. But that ends up kind of causing a lot of issue because these uh, 15 SV5 got a bug where I think in the Unix shutdown code pass and there's like no pointer. So that causes a lot of issue. So that that these are really something I wish to avoid in future. And some closing remark. So I think I think backporting is still so still has a lot of challenges. Like uh, we we oftentimes have to deal with bugs that are actually our own doing. So we backport with some error and we have to deal with it. And I think there's a talk in 2014 by Mikko that talks about uh, backporting horror stories. And hopefully maybe in the future, and for me, I could do backporting better. And that's it for my talk. So any comments or discussion? Test. Uh, is there any software package, basically, which you could recommend as a success story somewhere where you know that they do backporting correctly? Maybe you could blog about it, share it with other developers so they know how to do it properly because these guys are doing it for years and it works. Are you aware of any package that would be like a really good example of how it's done correctly? Maybe you mm -hmm. can say Caron, but I guess this is too big, you know, example for somebody who's looking for something smaller. I think, yeah, I think kernel is... And please blog about it if you can, that would be nice. <laughs> so so to, to make sure I get your question right, is, is there like smaller example of backporting done, done right? I, because I, I extensively work with kernel, I actually don't know, but I, I think, I think it ends up being, it, it, it's one thing I comes to mind is like kind of like a GitHub release workflow, so it it really depends on the software you 
you might have some luck finding for smaller software and they have a consistent release branch and these, they have also stable release that branch out that never merges with each other. That's something to look for, but I'm not aware of it as of now. Could we have some mic back there? Right. I was wondering about kernel ABI breakage. So suppose your object where you have to add your member, your new member. So you said you need to check if it's not part of any other structure that's also, also part of the kernel KBI. So prevent the case that a kernel creates an object that is later on read by a module and the module gets it wrong because doesn't know about the new member. Yes. I was thinking you've got to check for arrays as well. Arrays. It's another aggregate and it's a bit harder. Okay. And you've got to prevent a case where you actually, the kernel creates an array which has got this extra member uh -huh. and the module reads it, not knowing that there is an extra member and it reads it, reads it wrong. Yeah, definitely. So I'm afraid there's more to it than just uh, larger structures containing your structure. Yeah. There are also other aggregates. I think KVI is just like very difficult to ensure correctly. It, even we, if we do have to check for KVI, it's always not comprehensive. I think it doesn't check for error mm -hmm. array, like you said, and also for the macro and the header files, I think it would be another issue. Mm -hmm. I think also mentioned by you previously, I'm not too sure. And what else? Yeah, KAVI is, is, I think, one of the major, the, the most difficult thing to deal with during that porting. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully it's worth it. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, regarding KBI tracking and making sure that we don't break it, unfortunately. So Petr Pavel was supposed to be giving a talk here at the Labs conference because he did a lot of work on potentially moving away from our current uh, KBI checker to a new one based on Lib Abigail. Um, and he, he's done a lot of work there, but unfortunately he got sick. So hopefully he'll be able to present his work at some future point. But there are new developments happening in the day as well. Oh, and on the topic of array, I think there is some new, I'm not sure, like new pragma or something coming to GCC and Clang that lets you specify the length of the error if, as long as the, the, the length is another member of the same struct. I think I saw some discussion on Twitter about that. So maybe, maybe that would help? No, not, not too sure, <laughs> yeah. I think you might want to come to the front later for it, Mike. But. So as far as I understand, your workflow centers around Kilt and the serious con file. So yes. I'm wondering whether this is not additional pain compared to just using Git for everything, at least in the development phase and even in the maintenance phase, maybe importing all patches into Git, then doing read bases, format patch again, and then commit that somewhere? I think... This actually probably have been discussed before. And th but as far as I know, the, the quilt flow matches our development flow platter. That, that's the answer I know, that, that, that I heard. And I think mostly because uh, we, we, this, the, the quilt workflow works really well when you have some out of order insert and you when you have all of order insert for Git, maybe you use Git rebase and cherry pick, you kind of lost all the history. But whereas if you use a code workflow, you just have a new commit in your, a new change in your serial comp, and you can go back to it and bisect and do all kind of different stuff with it. So you, you kind of keep, keep the, the, all the tools that you can use. Sort of, so, mm, 
Yeah, I, I don't think I answered that question that well. Maybe I know there's a lot of people that knows it just better than me, so maybe they can answer. Yeah, that's been a um, long time ago that we discussed that. And the merit of the having the patches is so pretty applied by Kilt is that we keep the upstream changes as is. So I mean, so we know that upstream backports in that commit. And if we do apply in the normal gateway, that change is somehow buried in the history. So we cannot know whether this patch was applied cleanly for that kernel. And the problem is happens if we bump up the kernel version from the A to higher version. And we need to track so which patch, which change have been so fully applied, which not. Yeah, that was uh, one of the issues that we wanted to make sure by so by so applying the patches ex uh, so explicitly. Uh, so, is there some work going on in tracking uh, the hidden dependencies, like behavior changes? Uh, as far as I know, there is. There isn't. There's some. Yeah, as far as I know, there isn't because the dependency, uh, as I like, the dependency can be kind of murky. Like, like, do you so? So let's see. Uh, because oftentimes, for I guess for the feature, maybe it's possible. Like you could say a feature depend on not a feature, but for the fixed commit, it'll be quite difficult because you cannot really say this fix needs this feature. It, it just affects it, but it's not really a dependency. So maybe that will be possible for the feature part of the comment. But as far as I know, there isn't, there is currently no work on track of it. It, it. it will be great if there is. I think for, the, for everyone who does backporting, that will benefit, but not right now. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I see there's no metadata to track. Yeah. So it will require something like static analysis over um, the code and the data structures to, to figure out what changed and what would that imply. Yeah. I think there should be some tool that does what you say, like static analysis and try to try to analyze it. But yeah, probably no like a database that we, or no metadata existing. I, I was looking into it and I could not find any tool. Yeah, I, I, I hope someone will create it. Maybe maybe you will. I think yeah. I have used up my time slot actually, so maybe last question, Hello. sorry. Yeah. I noticed that you use self-test during, uh, during the development. Would you recommend to use self-test for BPF also for QE so we can test uh, BPF on each uh, product release on, or maintenance update? Yeah, I would definitely like to do that if, if we can find some way to run it or run at least some minimum set, that would be, that would be really good. Uh, do you need to use a specific versions of self-test or you can use always the latest one? So the self-test, in, in theory, the, the self-test that comes with the kernel should be used because that's backported along with all the other code. Yes. All right, thank you.